Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the six uh, webinar series here in um, Chagas, uh, Sligo Leitrim, Donegal. My name is James Keane. I'm the regional manager here in Sligo Leitrim and Donegal. I uh, just want to welcome tonight, um, uh, I want to welcome tonight uh, Patsy Ryan from Law Pro, who's going to present our first presentation. And also then I also want to welcome my colleague, Sean Rorty, who is going to do the second presentation of the evening. Um, tonight's topic is it's going to be very interesting um, and all it's going to be very, very relevant um, to everybody on, on the call tonight. And um, we're dealing with water quality issues in the prior, priority action areas. And we're also going to cover a topic which is very important in, in all areas of where, where sheep farming has taken place is, is best practice in dealing with, with uh, sheep dip. So just, I suppose, a reminder, look at if, if people are coming on, I just want to remind people there's a questions and answers tab at the bottom of your screen. So if you have a question, you can please just type it in there, please. And we'll take the questions at the end of the end of the presentations. So look, at without further hesitation, I'll, I'll welcome in Patsy Ryan from Law Pro here. So. Patsy, if you're there and you could share your screen, please, and you're very welcome this evening, Patsy. Uh, thanks very much. Um, thanks for having me. So, yep, thanks very much. So, as Jim said, my name is Patsy Ryan. Um, I work as a catchment scientist as part of the Local Authority Waters Programme. And tonight I want to talk about water quality issues in our priority areas for action, and I want, want to, with a particular focus on sheep dip. Okay, so I just want to talk about who we are. I'll talk about how water quality is determined, our work, and I'll talk specifically about how sheep dip affects our rivers. And then I'll finish off with a few case studies from the border region. Okay, so as I say, we're the local authority waters program and we're a shared service. So we work on behalf of all local authorities across Ireland. And our aim is to help improve and maintain clean water. So we want to achieve good or high water quality status in our water bodies. So in our rivers, our lakes, estuaries, coastal and groundwater bodies. But tonight, I'll focus specifically on river team. That's who, who I belong to. And we're involved with the scientific assessment of rivers. So we go out and collect the data. We analyze the data and then we hopefully put mitigation actions in place to try and improve water quality. And then we have communities, the, the, the team, um, and they work with local areas so they can provide expert advice in terms of biodiversity and water quality, but also help with funding opportunities for local community groups. Um, and like I say, we're part of the border region team. So we cover Donegal, Cavan, Monaghan. And you can see the, the regions there on the map to the right. But to find out more, you can go to www.localauthoritywaters.ie. OK, so we're here because of the European Water Framework Directive. So this is um, European legislation to have their waters up to good status, at least good status or high by 2027. And it also states that every country needs to have a plan of action of how they're going to do that. So this is our plan for Ireland. So this is a river management plan for between 20 years. Okay, so we have lots of river lakes and water bodies in Ireland. So we needed to prioritise where we're going to work. So this is a new targeted approach, 190 areas of action, areas for action were chosen across the country because rivers in these areas for action were at risk of not achieving their water quality objectives and you can see the areas on the map to the left there so as part of this plan this river basin management plan there was a new initiative set up between the local authority waters program and ASAP so the agricultural sustainability and advisory program um, and that's to help protect restore water quality where, where agriculture is suspected to be a pressure. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Now, we're coming to the end of 2021. So this management plan is, is going to be out but We are looking forward and we have a new river basin management plan, which covers 2022 to 2027. And there is a virtual consultation room open at the moment. So you can go in and look at the plan, look at where we, where we, what we'll be doing to try and focus on water quality 
and, and the areas that we're looking to work in and you can make a submission based on the information in there. But like I said, the Agricultural Sustainability Support and Advisory Programme came out of this River Basin Management Plan. And this is a, a, um, led by Chagas. Um, and where, like, wherever we find agricultural pressures related, and water quality pressures that are related to agriculture, we refer these on to the ASAP advisor. And the ASAP advisor, so Sean here tonight, um, he will work with landowners and provide free confidential advice on agricultural practice to protect water quality. It's a really good initiative working together. Okay, so these are the 37 priority areas for action in the border region. So you can see these, I'll just leave that up for a moment. And these are the priority areas for action in Donegal. So I'll talk, be talking about Donegal a lot tonight. Um, and these are the areas that we're, we've been working in. So there are 12 all together from initial and all the way down to South Donegal. So a lot of the areas, like I say, we have been working in these areas, but these areas will continue to be worked in in the next cycle. So between now and 2027. The River Finn, now the River Finn, we, we, we're not managing, this is under a catchment care project, so it's slightly different, but the rest we are working in. Okay, so I'll talk about how water quality is determined. So across Europe, all surface waters, so all rivers and lakes are assigned a water quality status, ranging from high, which is excellent water quality, so unpluted. So these are our most pristine sites and they're most most ones that are most close to how they would naturally be if humans hadn't interfered and, and caused changes to them. Then we have good water quality, which is unpolluted or satisfactory. And then we have moderate, poor and bad. So anything that falls below good, unfortunately, um, fails to achieve the, the required status. So that's what I mean. We, we're aiming to get our water bodies to good or high status. There we go. Um, and status is determined by the Environmental Protection Agency. What they do is they look at the different aspects of the river. So they look at the biology, they look at the invertebrates, so the, the animals without a backbone that live in the, the river, um, to try and to determine what quality that we have there. So just this is the scale on the right here of a poster, it's, it's green down to red. Um, and in a healthy river, you tend to have the animals that live or at the top of the poster there. So the flat-bodied mayflies, the stoneflies and the caddisflies, these tend to really need well oxygenated, clean rivers. So if you have a community that's composed of those, then it's likely that the river is in good status. And the EPA will also look at the fish, the plants and the algae. Okay. And other support in chemistry data is looked at. So how much nutrients are in the water across, so phosphorus, nitrogen, ammonia, and also the physical form of the river, so the hydromorphology. So generally, a river that is as natural as possible will support the healthiest e ecosystem. So when we look at a river, we want a river that hasn't been dredged, that hasn't had its banks modified in any way. You know, those natural intact rivers will support healthy ecosystems and a healthy, healthy river. Okay, and I've put, um, so if one of, it's the one out, all out approach. So if one of these elements fails, so say the fish or the invertebrates fail, then the whole water body fails. So really we want to try and make sure our rivers are as healthy as possible in, in regard to all of these aspects. So I've just put invertebrates in bold here. So tonight we're talking, well, I focus on sheep dip. Um, and unfortunately, sheep dip has the same effect on the river invertebrates as it does on the, the ectoparasites that it aims to get rid of on sheep. So if sheep dip gets into the river, unfortunately it has a really detrimental impact on these invertebrates. And because these are the main, these are the main ways we tell how clean a water body is, it can really affect this, this scarring system and the health of the river. Okay. So in terms of water quality, what water quality is like, so 53% of surface waters are in good or high status. So 53% of our rivers and lakes are in good or high. But that means 47% are in unsatisfactory status. So we need to work on those 47%. 
We're also seeing a decline in our high status sites. So like, like I said, those are the high status, those are the pristine rivers, which they're, they're becoming more and more rare as time goes on. Um, and this is a map of the status of Ireland onto the right there. So this was last updated in 2018. So this is our most recent data. Um, and the rivers and lakes are color coded. So we should be seeing more green and blues, but you can see that we have quite a lot of yellows and oranges in there. So I'll talk a little bit about, more about our high status sites. Um, and there is a blue dot catchment program and this aims to really try and look after our high status water bodies. So they are really important. Um, and unfortunately, we, we are losing them. So this is a map of the high status sites and you can see they're mostly on the Western seaboard, but there are some in the middle and to the east of the country. Um, and this is the data of our high status sites over time. So looking back to 1987, around, we had about 31% of rivers that were monitored were at high status in total. And looking forward to 2014 to 2017, we've seen a big drop. So now it's only around about 17% of our waters are at high status sites. Okay, so we've seen it, we are seeing a decline. Okay, so in terms of what affects water quality, so pollutants can be variable. So we could get pollution from forestry. So this could be in the form of nutrient runoff, particularly phosphorus. It could be from sediment from forestry, particularly if a forestry has been clear felled recently the sediment can run off. And sediment's particularly detrimental to the river as it can clog up the substrate. So it means less, less space for the invertebrates that live in the river, but also they can you know, clog fish gills, clog um, habitat for fresh water pill mussels, et cetera. So forestry can be a pressure. It could also cause acidification. So especially where it's planted up in peatlands, it tends to make areas that are already very acidic um, even more so. So we could have forestry pressures. We could have agriculture pressures. And again, this, this could be from nutrient runoff. So the likes of phosphorus, nitrogen, ammonia, but also things like land drainage, again, sediment release from agricultural activities or pesticides. So MCPA or um, sheep dip, as we're talking about tonight. We then have urban runoff pressures. So you might imagine in built up areas, there are a variety of different contaminants that can come off the urban area. Urban areas flow down drains and into watercourses really easily. We have wastewater pressures. If the wastewater, pre wastewater treatment plant isn't functioning properly, we can have huge amounts of nutrients released from there. And finally, we have rural dwelling pressures. So these pressures come from the form of septic tanks. So say if the septic tank isn't functioning properly or hasn't been desludged recently, then these can cause, again, nutrient pressures to the water costs. So pressures are variable. It really depends what type of catchment you're working in um, and what's around in terms of land use. OK, so our work, when we go into our priority, priority areas for action, our first part of call is to try to figure out what's happening. So what's the issue? We do our des desktop study. Um, we look to see what the issue is. Is it phosphorus? Is it nitrogen? Is it sediment or pesticides? We try to figure out where it's coming from. So agriculture or urban wastewater, or is it unknown? Sometimes it's unknown. And then what is the pollution pathway? So the pathway could be overland flow where you have peaty soils. It could be groundwater flow where you have freely draining soils. Or it could be via a pipe, as a pipe. So we gather a lot of that information first. We then hold a public and, and then a farmers meeting. And this is a chance for us to, to gather local knowledge on the catchment, which is a very variable. Um, and it's also a chance to let people know we'll be working in the catchment as well. So our field work then involves going out to do kick samples a lot of the time, to look at the invertebrates, to collect chemistry, to do walkovers. And then finally, once we've gathered all this information, we make a referral. So say if we have an agricultural pressure, we'll refer it for, make a referral to ASAP, the Agricultural Sustainability Support and Advisory Programme. Or if it's a forestry pressure, we'll make a referral to forestry. And if it's 
a wastewater treatment plant or a discharge license that's not working properly, then we make a referral to EPA or the county council. It just depends on the situation. Okay, so like so, step one would be our kick samples. So these are we look at the bi these are the biological indicators, and they can really tell us what's going on in the river, whether it's polluted, um, and what that pollution might be. So we can get an indication of whether it's sediment or whether it's um, insecticide that's got into the river, or various different things. We also take measurements of dissolved oxygen levels, the temperature, the pH, and the electrical conductivity which is a proxy for how much organic pollution is in the water. Step two would be our walkovers. So say we've done a kick sample at the top of the catchment um, and the kick sample looks excellent quality, but we do one at the bridge downstream and we notice a drop in quality. We'll then walk the catchment to see if we can notice any signs of pollution or uh, anything that's not quite right along the catchment. And step three is bringing all this information together and hopefully making our referral to, to um, mitigate the, the, the pollution. So I mentioned pollution pathways earlier. So we always think of this source pathway receptor model when we, when we think of the pollution pathway. So the receptor is the river or the lake, the source is the pollutant, and the pathway is just that mechanism by which the pollutant makes its way to the receptor. Um, and we know we can't, it's really hard to take the pollutant out of the river or the lake once it's got there. And we know we can't necessarily get rid of the source of pollution altogether. So our opportunity lies in breaking that pathway if we can. So tonight with a focus on sheep dips, so the source could be a sheep dipping holding area. A pathway could be a pipe draining the runoff and the receptor would be the river or the lake. Okay, so in terms of, I'll talk a little bit more about sheep dip now. So how does sheep dip affect our rivers? And I've taken this quote from Bug Life. So this is the Invertebrate Conservation Trust. Um, and it, this just says, a few drops of cypermethrin from sheep dip. Dripping from a wet sheep into a stream will kill all the invertebrates for up to 10 kilometres downstream. So it, it has a huge impact on the invertebrates in the river. And we found that during our, our work. So just this is a food web of the river. So at the bottom we have the detritus, which is the dead leaves, the diatoms and the algae. And then above that we have the animals that feed on the algae and the diatoms and the detritus. So your mayflies, your caddisflies, stoneflies, etc. And then above that we have the trout and the kingfisher and heron. So it's all related. And if we do get rid of these invertebrates in the river, you can see we're taking two rows out of the, 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 um, the web web of, of life here so you know it could it, it does have a drastic impact on the ecosystem so where you do miss those invertebrates you may have an algal bloom say because there's nothing eating the algae but also the trout has nothing to feed on and it can affect higher higher organisms like the kingfisher and the heron okay but i've got two videos to illustrate this a bit better Rather than, rather than me talking. So the video on the left here, this is a typical kick sample of a healthy stream. It has caddisflies and mayflies and stoneflies wiggling around there. You can see lots of detritus in there. So I'll just play it again, just in case it was a bit jittery. So that's the signs of a healthy river, really. It's, it's a little ecosystem on its own. So it's a biodiverse sample. And then this one, so this sample has been affected by toxicity. And you can see there's nothing in there. So the invertebrates have sort of been completely been wiped out. So this is a more severe site that we found. I'll play that again just. Oh. Okay, so in terms of our priority areas for action, so where has sheep dip been suspected? So we found it's been suspected up in the Glen Lacquer River, 
the River Finn, but does said that's under catchment care management. And it's also been found in Donegal Southwest and Merlin's priority area for action. Now, the allowable amount of cyclomethrin in surface waters is really low. So it's 0 0.00008 micrograms per litre, which is absolutely tiny. So that's equivalent of one gram of cypermethrin in approximately 5,050 metres Olympic swimming pools. So the standard is set really low because it is so toxic and the standard is set so low to protect the aquatic life. Now the Environmental Protection Agency did monitor some rivers in, in, the, um, in Donegal and they did find exceedances. So this is just one example. Um, they found exceedances that were 98 times higher than this allowable amount. So you get quite a, a huge jump in what's, what would have a, an impact on the aquatic life. Okay, so I'll just go through a few case studies here. So this is again lack of catchment. Um, and just going through that table there. So it is, it's a Glen Lacquer, it, it's at risk. We, we wanted to get to good status um, and you can see the status history. So for 2007, 2007, 2009, it was at good status. But then between 2010 and 2015, it dropped to poor. Now the good news is it, looked, it returned to good status in 2018, uh, but it was still important to go out and assess the river to see how things look now. Okay, so we did a local catchment assessment back in 2019, and we did kick samples at site one, site two, and site three down the river. Now at site one, we had an indeterminate um, kick sample score, but the habitat wasn't great for sampling. But, but looking at the invertebrates that we found, we didn't see any toxicity from insecticide. So we didn't, uh, we didn't suspect insecticide had gotten to the river here. Site two was probably not significantly impacted and site three was the same. So overall, for those sites on the river, those sites indicated that the river was still at good quality. So we were quite happy with this. But what we did do was we made a protect referral to ASAP just to provide advice and guidance when using agricultural chemicals in the area. You know, we, we've got this river, well, this river has returned to good status and we, we want to maintain that going forward. Okay, here's another example of a river in Donegal, Southwest Merlins. So again, the water quality is at risk. The status objective is good, so we want to get it to good. And you can see between 2007 to 2012, the river was at good status. But from between, between 2013 and 2018, it's dropped to moderate. And in 2018, it, it was still moderate. And what the suspected pressure here was agriculture and toxicity from insecticide. Now we did a local catchment assessment here in summer 2020, and we surveyed four sites down the river. So at all sites, unfortunately, our invertebrate samples were probably impacted and we suspected toxicity in the form of insecticide that has caused this. We saw a particular drop between site one at the top of the catchment and site two. So we, we suspected animals or livestock that possibly could have gotten into the river that had been treated with insecticide. This could have caused this drop. And unfortunately, a site four was seven kilometers downstream and we still didn't find any animals down here. So we, shot, we saw this impact seven kilometers downstream of um, the, the, the source of pollutant, unfortunately. So it's quite a drastic impact on the river. That's just a drop between site one and site two. So again, we made um, a restore referral. So we want to restore this river back to good quality. We made this to ASAP, again, to provide advice and guidance. Um, in terms of good practice when using agricultural chemicals. And finally, so this is uh, River 2. So again, this is in southwest Mer uh, Donegal Southwest Merlins. So the river is at risk. Now, this is what was one of our high status objective rivers. Do you remember I mentioned that we're losing these high status rivers? And you can see between 2007 to 2009, it was at high status but between 2010 and 2018, it's dropped to good. 
Now, 2020, we saw it return to high, which was excellent. We were delighted. But as of this year, it's dropped again back to poor quality. Um, so referral to Sean um, to provide advice and guidance. So just a summary, um, so I suppose chemicals such as sheep dip can cause a dramatic drop in water quality, even at really small concentrations, tiny concentrations, and the effect on the invertebrate community can be seen for kilometres downstream, as we saw. Um, and Law Pro are working, we're working closely with ASAP to hopefully reduce the incidences of toxicity. In the priority areas for action, so you have a huge impact on water quality and freshwater ecosystems. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. I'll, I'll pass you back to James and Sean now. Thanks very much, Patsy. Uh, thanks, thanks for, for that uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. And um, I suppose if you can, yeah, if you, Sean, if you want to start screen sharing, um, and while Sean is doing that, I just remind people. The questions and answers tab is at the bottom of the screen if anyone wants to, to, to send in some questions for uh, Patsy or Sean, um, and we'll deal with them at the end of um, Sean's presentation. So over to you, Sean, there. Thanks, James, and uh, thanks, Patsy. Um, I suppose I'll, I'll get straight into it. Uh, just go through the outline of my presentation for this evening. I'm just basically going to go through the main pressures that I'm finding out um, throughout the county uh, over the past couple of years and I suppose just just putting in the best practice advice along with those and the, look at these are applicable to to farmers whether you're in the, the catchments the PAAs or you're not um, I suppose look at the first thing I'm going to look at round bale silage but I'm just going to take it right back to basics uh, farmyard manure for example overgrazing on peat exposed soil the damage that caused by uh, rotten um, from machinery and also poaching and then looking at yards, you know, keeping clean water, clean, dirty water separate, looking at drainage, uh, drinking points, button spraying, and the button tillage. And I suppose I'm not focusing on um, fertilizer, fertilizer application or slurry as such, but look, um, I'm just going to highlight the importance of your riparian margin. So your buffer strip at the end of your field, which which acts as a, as a buffer uh, between potential nutrients escaping into the, the local drains or water courses. And then I'm just going to focus on the sheep dip then at the very at the very end and give the best practice advice. So beginning with the round bales, um, I suppose look at the, the legislation states we're not to store those bales within 20 meters of, of waterways and that's surface waters. And that includes dry drains. Okay, so the furthest away they are from, from a dry drain, a wet drain, whatever you want to call it, the better because look at when, when these bales get damaged or, or, or the leak, um, we have a problem because that afternoon is going to end up, it's going to run with water, it's going to end up in a water course. So, for example, very wet bales, you know, they would have a very low dry matter. There is a possible leakage there if those bales get damaged. I include uh, a photo there at the bottom, bottom right. Um, just on uh, this is bales that I observed uh, sighted poorly um, at, the, at the bottom or an end field basically and the soil type was very wet underfoot um, and the important thing here is or, or the thing that the farmer shouldn't have been doing is storing these bales because that blue line that uh, I'm pointing towards there in the hedge there's actually a water course flowing down um, which is less than five meters from the bales so farmers on there backing in uh, be it spiking or grabbing them bales there's potential for them bales get damaged and look at the leak and that's it uh, we have a problem okay so silage pits then um whether you call it a base or slab or whatever you want to call it look at we we, we need to have um adequate storage for silage effluent okay so the, make sure that the concrete base is sound with no cracking um, because again, uh, if we have cracking on, on the silage base, effluent is going to find its way into a water course. Um, 
So look at and along with that, you know, keeping the channels clean and, and, and clear and making sure that they're working properly. That's hugely important. And you wouldn't you wouldn't believe them in the amount of farms that I'm out and you know these things these are the things that I'm observing when I'm out. Basically it's the basics and I suppose it's just to give you maybe you know the heads up basically on what what you know can prevent the stuff from ending up in, in water. Okay. So so the side space then make sure that it's cleaned as often as you can uh, and again just minimizing them blockages just to, to the afternoon channels okay so that top uh, right picture there that that's direct side of jefflund ending up in the water course and you can see there that there's a sewage type um sludge fungus basically uh, developed in that that stream that's the, the telltale sign basically that, that we have a problem we also, I have a photo, nice photo down there at the bottom, uh, a covered silage pit. Now I'm not gonna, uh, you know, tell everyone to go out and, and, and cover silage pits like that, but there are a few nice examples of, of that throughout the, the county. And uh, it's on intensive dairy farms uh, in particular. And look, these are these are ways of, of, of preventing um, excess water mixing with this silage effluent off, off the slab. So farmyard manure then, look at, again, going back to legislation, uh, it can't be stored or land spread between the 1st of November to the 31st of January. That's in Donegal and Leitrim and 1st of November to 15th of January in Sligo. And again, collecting all those organic um, effluents that are, you know, if there is direct discharge, that, you know they have to be um their pairs of effluent tank and so on so there can't be no seepage no runoff uh into groundwater water or surface water and you can see there in that picture um that that the farmyard when you're in that instance is in close proximity to a little stream or a drain and look at that's that's a no no because if you look at the soil type there you can see it there in the top half a meter it's sitting on an organic peat soil and look, those nutrients can't be absorbed into that that um, that soil type, and what happens is it just runs over over, over the soil surface, and it ends up in that water course. So look, at, if you're storing farm manure in the field, it has to be a minimum of twenty meters away from all surface waters, and that's the legislation. That's the minimum. The best practice is to keep it as far away as you possibly can, because again, what are given our heavy, high rainfall. In, in the northwest and along the west coast, you know, these nutrients are ending up in the water because the amount of high rainfall basically that, that we're getting. So again, do not spread within five meters of surface waters, right? That the same is applicable to slurry. And that's extended to 10 meters, two weeks, either side of the close period. Okay. And again, if your field is sloped, if, if there's greater than a 10 degrees slope in your field, which look at the vast majority of fields by and large are, again, 10 meters is the minimum uh, buffer that you should be observing there around those fields. And then just look good practice when you're, when you're spreading, considering um, spreading farm manure or slurry or fertilizer, you know, identify where the surface waters are in your field. Obviously go with the weather conditions, um, make sure that the soil conditions are correct under a foot. Uh, observe the sl slope of the field, potential for runoff, etc. And look at maintain your adequate buffers. And look at um, it's better that the that the uh, the nutrients are retained in the field rather than ending up in the water courses or the ditches. So another um, problem that I, I see occasionally too is overgrazing of peat soils. Okay, so. The examples I have there at the bottom of your screen, we have a nice cover there on the left hand side, and then on the right hand side, we have exposed bare peat, and that's sitting over a kind of exposed rock, really. It's kind of a karst. Um, and what what's the problem with this? You might be asking, look at, again, as Patsy alluded to earlier, um, your ha what happens there is heavy rainfall, that sediment, that loose peat, is going to wash off that uh, particular field and it's going to go straight into a drain or a water course as well. And along with that, uh, that karst type um, landscape, what you probably have under that, um, that, that, that bare peat there is a gravel and uh, you know, there's a good bit of rock there as well. So potentially uh, that, that peat uh, could, you know, the sediment could end up 
in uh, ground water as well, okay, and reappear somewhere else uh, along the water course. And don't forget, there's an ammonia issue with, with, with bare peat like that as well, okay. So the sediment is lost with, with heavy rainfall, and it takes a long time for that vegetation to recover, okay. That's, that's what I want to uh, acknowledge there. So again, exposed soil, look at uh, farmers are busy, they're in, a, in and out of gateways, etc. But look at, uh, now they're, they're extreme um, photos that I've up there, but look at this is what you observe from time to time, uh, be it out wintering uh, and round feeders and, and, and maybe farmers are, uh, they're allowing that sacrifice paddock with the intention of, of, of reseeding following spring. But you know, this, the situation is that soil is highly mobile, that sediment, and as, as I previously outlined before, sediment goes hand in hand with phosphorus, and phosphorus ends up in the waters. We have a problem, okay, along with the sediment. So again, you're trying to minimize that that ext extremities basically. Um, and, and again, if you are out wintering, that you're moving your ring feeders, your, your feet and truss, uh, and not allowing that um, situation basically to manifest itself. Okay, and look at you, you get that, but you, you know you get rotten in the way you know taking out silage bales, etc. As well, and it's just trying to minimise that um, that 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 type of impact. So yards again, uh, cleaning dirty water. I don't know how many um, farmers. It's the same advice basically that I give to farmers uh, in the areas. Look at. Um, some yards you go on, they're very nice, they're very clean. Uh, eave shoots are working correctly, and the gutters are all clean, etc. And then other yards you go on, and, and things aren't so so neat, right? But um, the fact is, um, if if you, you look at some some loose houses, it could be high straw on, inside, uh, cows calving or whatever, laybacks, etc. And those um, some of them floors mightn't be uh, channeled or, or or sloped towards a, a tank. And in some instances, you do see seepage coming out of those sheds uh, and running across the yard directly straight into, into a stream. So a very, very simple uh, thing that you could put in place there is just a, a simple concrete lip or a bond along the, that, that, those gateways that I've highlighted in red there, basically. Just a little concrete lip. It'll retain the, 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 the affluent or, or, the, or the seepage out onto the yard minimizing clean water and your and you know a, a dirty yard basically so that's what you're trying to do keep clean water clean diverting that away and keeping your dirty dirty water um confined you know to to your certain areas and making sure that you're scraping or cleaning or brushing whatever you want to do with it afterwards um so again look at i just put up look at that's a nice example up there of a nice clean yard um so it's brushed and look at you know look at on the right hand side there you have uh you have you have cattle out um or a ring feeder out in the yard and look at that 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 uh seepage or effluent whatever you want to call it 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 has to be collected okay so it's classified as slurry once um the organic matter goes above a certain percentage So drainage then, look at, um, farmers do drain their land. There's no point saying otherwise. Um, and when you do, they do so, there's a certain amount of sediment that has loosened around the drain uh, edge. Uh, ideally, you want to be um, carrying out any um, drainage work when the soil is, is, is dry. You don't want to be carrying it out um, when it's wet and it's prone to slippage or bank slippage. Because that sediment, that soil that's, that's loose in that bank, it's just going to fall onto the fall back into the drain, and it's going to make its way um, down into a water course or a drain. So, look at the advice is any uh, maintenance to surface water drain should only be carried out during the months of July to September. Okay, and this is um, to avoid the the spawning uh, period from say from September up to February, uh, and that that's 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 uh, provided for under legislation on the F Fisheries Act, okay? And then any in-stream works that, that you're planning to do or anything that you're planning to do, you know, in, in the future, you need to consult and get approval from Dunland Fisheries. It's very important, you know, to talk to the, the guys in Dunland Fishery if, if you ever were considering anything to do with um, streams and so on. But that particular stream up there now, um, if you take the, the one there to the left, um, ideally, 
what, what that farmer should have done was left about a 20 meters stretch at the bottom end of that field to act as a natural buffer to catch that sediment from higher up that, that field, basically, to act as a filter system. Okay. So I just put in a photo there on the right hand side. It's in a different context. It's, it, you can see there it's on a peat type soil, but nonetheless, um, a straw bale. Uh, there's a straw bale there, and, and you know, that, ba that bale basically is capturing the sediment from, from going down into the down into the, the water course. Okay, just simply placing the bale into the into the, the, the drain bed, uh, if you want to call it, and staking it in well. And, and you catch the sediment. And you can see the sediment there at, at, towards, uh, at the front, at the lower end of the photo there, you can see the brown sediment acc accumulating. You can see the, the, the iron uh, ochre that's, that's, that's actually in that water. And again, the, the two pictures at the bottom, same situation, it's just shown one with a, with a dry bed, uh, where there's a significant accumulation of, of, of sediment. And again, the one on the right, there's actually, um, a filter system and built into that as well. Um, so look at these are just practical little things that you can do um, to minimize basically sediment ending up in your, in your water course or your stream. Again, drinking points. Uh, look at legislation is in place there now for derogation farmers. You know the drinking points now have to be a minimum twenty meters back from from water courses as outlined on your OSI map, um, and that's for. Farmers stocked above 170 uh, kilos organic nitrogen. And look at the two pictures we have there on the right. Um, that's the scenario we're trying to avoid, where, where cattle would have direct access and cause that amount of sedimentation and saltation of that water. Uh, what, you know, glass has, has put a lot of fencing in place along water courses. And I suppose the middle picture there at the bottom, that's the ideal scenario that we're, that we're trying to achieve basically going forward. Okay. So again, spraying, I'm just going to touch on it. Uh, best practice advice, you know, no heavy rain should be forecast within 48 hours if you're planning to go out and do a bit of spraying. Make sure, again, that there's no standing water in the field. You know, do the squishy boot, boot test underfoot and make sure there's, there's, that your soil isn't waterlogged and ground conditions are good, right? And, and that your weeds and your grass, et cetera, is, uh, you know, is they're actively grown. Okay, that they're alive and 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 they're they're able to take up this this chemical. Okay, and just make sure as well, correct method of application. Only use the boom sprayer for the MCPA. Uh, again, observing your cam conditions if, if applying product using uh, a boom sprayer and so on. Observing your 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 buffer zones and that's on the back of your labels. It's typically five meters for MCPA. And again, disposing and and rinsing out your your containers properly uh, after use. And I suppose the, the big one there is never use, you know, never fill the, the sprayer directly from a water course. And, you know, look at MCPA, sh you know, sh shouldn't be used from the 30th of September up to the 1st of March. Okay. So tillage then, look at, um, be, be it reseeding or, or plowing for, for crops or whatever, um, shouldn't be taking place within two meters of a, of, of a water course. Uh, again, based on, on your OSI map, but look at that's the best practice. Look at, you're going to get bank slippage, that, that, that picture there in the bottom right, that's just um, just a, just permanent pasture basically, and you can just see the, the, the bank slippage that you have. There's no fence up, up along there that, that's actually loosened the soil or anything. It's just that that particular water body floods from time to time. And you can see there the, the, the part, parts of the, the field just dropping into the, into the river. Okay, so look at, um, we're trying to, again to minimize the sediment and the phosphate um, from running off those fields uh, and, and, and then up in our water courses. And as Pat, Pat, Patsy outlined, you know, that, you know, that they, they posed its own problems then for um, blocking up uh, gills and fish and et cetera, et cetera. I just threw, threw in this, this, uh, this slide here. This, this is a, a slide on filter fences or silt fences. You, you, you do see them along the roadways there in construction you know the, the construction firms would use them there for um for for salt fences basically for to capture any uh basically any any sedimentation that that may be running off due, due to roadworks etc and, and the forestry also use them and look the, the, they're using it over in the uk and the tillage scenario um it's basically basically a, a geotextile mesh and it's inserted into the ground foot but but a foot foot and a half deep whatever um and they they, they stake it into the ground 
and they put it in in such a way that it's you know it's a smile shape or a v shape um and that's basically to slow the flow and to create this ponton effect because these flashy floods that you know and, and heavy rainfall events that happen that sediment is carried down towards the bottom of the field that that sediment is captured there water gathers and the sediment just falls down uh and, and, and into the mesh okay so it's a short-term measure but look at they're using it over in east anglia um and look at uh, again it's capturing the sediment and, and the phosphate uh, as i say i didn't um focus on what he called it uh fertilizer or, or slurry tonight but look at i'm just focusing uh on, on this slide here just the importance of a good buffer um strip along along the water course it has multiple benefits um i mean the hedgerow dries out that that buffer naturally through evaporation and so on it, you know the runoff you get from a field in terms of nutrients that it potentially can carry there the nutrients are being used up by the vegetation in that buffer strip and obviously it's stopping erosion and it's reducing the speed of the water, leaving that area and into the stream as well from a from a flooding perspective as well. Okay. So look at they have multiple benefits. And I suppose look at it'll be it'll be something that'll form a large part of, of the next cap, no doubt. So I'm just gonna go straight on to sheep dip now. Um I'm just gonna I just made up the slide and basically it's just shown the amount of rainfall that we have gotten uh in Donegal over the last number of years. And if you look at the bottom left there, I started the, the scale at a thousand. This has a thousand millimeters, that's a, a meter of rain. Um, and that goes up to 1.6 or 1 1.5 was the top end, I would say, in um 2020 last year. So I have it for 18, 19, and 20. I have the long term average on, on the right hand side. And I suppose this information uh, is, you know, what 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 weather stations we're looking at is Malin and Funner. OK, and look at um, they mightn't be totally representative of, of, of the west of the of the county. But look, at they're as good a gauge as you're going to get. And look, at you can see there for your, yourself. I know 2018 was a, a, you know, we had a very good dry summer. But look at rainfall. You see that the rainfall. And the amount of um, the round, amount of rainfall that we're getting is increasing year and in year. So with that in mind, then sheep dip. Look at we have to look at the topography. And Patsy can alluded to the different um, instances, uh, say of, of sus suspected sheep dip that that we've observed over the last, um, particularly in July of this year, uh, around the county. And that just lends itself. Look at we have we have we have high mountainous uh, areas throughout the county, right down along the west coast. A lot of rainfall falls in those upland areas. Um, we have a lot of lakes up there, but eventually all that water comes back down to the, you know, the lower, the lower echelons. And I suppose look at sheep go up to the, those areas in the summertime, they try to avoid midges, um, the grass is sweeter, etc. So look at they go up uh, and what that that's the time that coincides with sheep dipping. Okay, so that you know huge numbers of sheep going up into those hills over the summer months so we've you know two main types of sheep dip organophosphates um and you know that diazinon type um active ingredients and then we have the pyrethroids and that was the cypermetron so you know look at they we know we all know what 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 uh ectoparasites they they control and how beneficial they are at doing that but i suppose as patsy rightly mentioned you know these insects um have a some very similar biology to the to the to the insects in the streams and those those insecticides are are killing the insects in the streams as well so that has a knock-on effect on the biology of of of, of the habitat etc so the best practice advice then make sure you you pick a cool dry day with, with good uh dry drying conditions right this is a slow job like traditionally if you look back over, over the years and, and farmers continue to do so when i when i ring up farmers you know Farmers usually teaming up two or three households going together and be three, four hundred sheep being, being dipped on the one day. It shouldn't be a rush job. People should take their time. They should plan it out um, from start to finish. Take their time when, when they're immersing the, the sheep and, and the bath. Make sure they're getting a full minute and making sure then that they're 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 waiting uh, that adequate time uh, in, in, in the drip pen, basically, so that 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 wet um so that that leakage and, and so on is captured back in the tank so identify identifying your holding pen or your field you're, okay there should be no open drains in that field if at all possible 
you know um or, you know just make sure that that's identified you've identified that field um and you know beforehand make sure that you check that the, the dipping tank is leak proof that it's structurally okay um there's no outlet pipe valve at the bottom um, it's not permitted it's it's in the legislation and you know the important thing that sheep are allowed to, to dry effectively after coming out of the the tank itself you see there on the left hand side you can see it's, it's a nice uh, concrete ridged um dripping funnel pen there coming out of the dip tank and all that dripping um uh, uh, liquid is basically been funneled back into the tank and and that's the important thing and again you can see the structural defects there in the base floor there of, of a holding pen within a dipping unit on the bottom uh, picture so look at um, sheep should be hold, held in the pen for about 24 hours after to make sure that they dry effectively uh, and they're not, they're not going up into open hills again afterwards crossing streams um, drinking out of drains or, 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 or rivers or whatever and, and possibly contaminating um, that water you know as, as, as Patsy said a very very small amount of cypermethrin for example can be detected a long long way away okay so after dipping again wash out wash out your pens make sure that the the wool the dags etc are, are, are lifted and uh, disposed of adequately um you know soak you know make sure, make sure that you're, you're washing that that pen with clean water and not the dipping liquid that's in, in the trough uh, again empty dip containers foil caps make sure that they're disposed of adequately um and you know according to the manufacturer's instructions so then when you're going to land spread it there's a rate there, one to three parts water um, for uh, sheep dip. And that works out about 1,760 gallons per, per acre, okay, uh, of diluted dip. So under no circumstances should they be disposed of to peat soils um, because peat soils cannot break down the active ingredients and the, uh, and the dip, okay. It's really on a mineral soil that we have these microbes that will actually break down uh, the active ingredients. So again, porons, um, you know, we all know the porons um, for lambs, et cetera. And that, they all also go for deltamethrin type um, porons um, that, that you might use for ticks and so on for lambs early on in the season. Again, if they end up in a water course, they have the potential to, to, to pollute uh, long stretches of rivers and streams. So again, ideally, you should be leaving those, uh, leaving those sheep and, 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 and lambs in, in a field to dry effectively again no access to water course or drain and look at a lot of people out there using injectable products uh, ivermectin type products and so on and look at the advice there is contact your local uh, local vet get best practice advice um, from from your vet and look at all those um, stages or, or, or principles that i just um, spoke about there they also apply to that, uh, the, the mobile operators, uh, the, the guys with the, the mobile showers, the jets, the plunge dip, and, and so on. So this is a nice example here that I, I've uh, seen recently out, out on uh, my, my travels. Uh, it's a covered um, sheep dipping unit. It's inside a shed. It's covered, but it's not in use, as you can see. Nice steel uh, lid on it. And you can see there that the shoot there, uh, the sheep shoot, there's three gates on it, three backing gates where the farmer can uh, ha you know, handle the sheep and the lambs himself. He can separate them out himself. One, one man operation it runs the, you know, the sheep through the dipping tank and, and all the liquid is, is funneled back into the tank and it's all captured and under a covered uh, system. So it's a, it's a, it's a nice uh, example. So, in summary, then I suppose look at what 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 we're trying to do is keep clean water clean uh, as best we can. Make sure that we're checking the weather um, and also checking the soil conditions, and that that applies for slurries, fertilizer, uh, and so on. Uh, in regard to sheep dip, we should be taking our time. Um, there's plenty of help. There's still plenty of help out there. Uh, farmers are teaming up. They're still going uh, two and three uh, from different households and, and they're dipping the one day. There's plenty of help um, for it to be effective and make sure that you're, you're getting bang for your buck in terms of, of, of the active ingredient that's actually in your, your, your sheep dip. You know, it's, it's an expensive product. 
um, you really should be um, making sure that those 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 dip are you know those sheep are dipped properly, and you know you're following best practice advice in relation to water quality because look at you know they mightn't be there uh, in the future, so look it's important. Uh, make a plan on how to dispose of, of of your dip safely then after use as well. Um, whatever you do, don't let it off. Don't let it off to a soakway uh, on peat soils because it's going to make its way up into a water course. And remember, the thing is, clean water is in everybody, everybody's interest, right? And that's including the wildlife and also your, your animals that's on your farm. They're also relying on clean water. Okay, so that's it. Uh, over to you, James. Oh, sorry, great, Sean. Um, thanks, thanks very much. Um, I'll just ask you to stop sharing your screen, yeah. Sean. I'll bring Patsy back in there, please. Great. Um, okay. Um, there's there's some questions here, so folks, um, I'll, I'll 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 kick it off and I and I'll see who wants to take them as we as we go. Um, just what about storing around bales of wilted uh, dry silage? Um, how far from a water course? Um. It's 20, it's 20 meters. That's what it is. That's the minimum. Uh, regardless, um, it's 20 meters from a water course. That's that's was that's was in the government um, legislation. Yeah, and I suppose it's important to make that point, Sean. That you know, farmers will say a good year like this year, you have very dry, high wilted silage, regardless of how dry it is or not. It has to be 20 meters back. That's, it does, yeah. That's perfect. Um, just and I think you answered it in your in your in your presentation anyway. Um, are the diazepon are the diazonine based sheep dips as pollutant to water courses as the cypermethane based sheep dips? Um, Sean. No, they're they're generally not. They're they're more um, detrimental to humans, as 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 we you know we all heard the stories uh, in, in the past, say of, of of people developing certain diseases and so on out of them. Um, no, they were they were they were a bit um, they, they were less of you know they had a, a lower effect basically on the biology compared to the cypermethan. The cypermethan type um, uh, insecticides they're 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 more detrimental to the biology and and the water um, and and uh, some coats between fifty and a thousand times more more deadly than di diazonum. Okay, so that's basically what that is. But, but you'd rather have neither in the in the. Yeah, well, they're both they're both potentially. Mm -hmm. It's all to do with the concentration. Uh, um, if the concentration, you know, if the right concentration ends up in the water course, well, you know, you're going to have a, a detrimental effect on the biology. Okay, and I just want to welcome in there. I see Gary O'Connell from Law Pros joined us as well. So hello, Gary. Just thanks, James. Um, I could just quickly add to that, James, as well, just on the diazonon and the cypermethrin. So. It's kind of reflected in the um, the water quality, the surface water regulations as well. So, um, the diazonon was mentioned, and the um, you know as a uh, supporting condition of the biology and the two thousand and nine regs. Um, I think the EQS for that was uh, 0 0.01 micrograms per liter at the time. Uh, Cypermethrin was then added in, in an amendment to the regulations in two thousand and fifteen. With uh, that EQS that Patsy mentioned there, it's about. Um, is it four or five times? It was eight by ten to the five, ten to the minus five. I think Patsy micrograms per liter. Um, so it's a it's a much tighter, much more stringent, you know, uh, EQS environmental quality standard on the the cypermethrin concentration. So that gives it an indication on itself, you know. Okay, great. Thanks for that, uh, Gary. Just um, Sean, a comment here. Um, it says, Sean, I like the idea of the bales in the drains to catch the soil or the sediment. Would you need to secure them? Um, and how often would you need to clean them out or change them, I suppose? Yeah, no, look at, ideally you want to stake them or post them in. Um, you can look at the post and just make sure that they're secu securely fixed, basically, uh, in place. And I suppose it's that it's that immediate period after, um, you know, that the drain cleaning has taken place that you're going to have the most sediment. And especially after heavy downpours of rain, et cetera, you're going, you're going to get a lot of sediment and, uh, washed down into that drain so potentially after after an event like that you would have to go and check it and make sure that you know that it's it's, it's continuing to work um yeah. and and you know you might need to clean that out to that that stage really yeah. that you know and that, and that tends to be the way the rain is coming now in big bursts like that so yeah it's um, yeah yeah just uh, maybe again just if, if i know the other guys want to cover this one or is there a chance sheep dipping uh, someone asks here is there a chance sheep dipping could end if water quality doesn't improve there is, yeah. There's a there's, there's a 
a huge chance. I mean, if you look at what happened over in the UK about maybe, well, 10, 11 years ago or around that, uh, cypermethrin was taken off, taken off the market. That was it. Um, end off and was was down to water quality issues, uh, in, uh, you know, over there, and and there was a push for it for, for the for those active uh, active ingredient uh, based products to be to be banned, which 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 they were. So mm-hmm. there, there is huge potential, yeah. So we have to be careful, like a lot of other, like even in antibiotics, we have to be careful with its use, um, obviously, um, going forward. Um, I, I think just on the sheep dip, and I think it's it's, it's a point you made, and, and Patsy and, and Gary are probably, I think from a practicality point of view, you know, a lot of people will be using those older sheep dips, Sean, and having the room. So even you're saying there to keep those sheep in a, in a field for 24 hours in a field, I suppose, without a, without any water courses nearby, just yeah. re-emphasize that point, I suppose. Yeah, it's hugely yeah. important because, you know, a lot of them sheep, Farmers naturally want those sheep to go back up and up into the open hills. That you know, they'll dry up there in a good summer's evening, um, and and they do want a couple of hundred sheep down their their good fields. They might be taking silage out, they might be taking hay out, or whatever the case may be. So, look at if you're going dipping, you need to plan this and 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 make sure that that, that there's no likelihood that you know sheep are crossing streams, basically. Yeah, I think that, and it's that's good advice. And you know, sometimes farmers are so busy, but it's it, you know, something a simple thing like that that a farmer will think, and you know, hopefully the next time they go dipping, you know, um, that they'll keep this in the in the forefront of their their mind. Um, just maybe Patsy, just to ask you, you, you talked about some of the, the 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 quality um coming back and going up and down on some of those rivers. Just maybe, does it take long for a river maybe that's in poor um quality? How long will that process take? Or you know, I know mm-hmm. it dropped very quick with it with a point source pollution, but does it take long to come back to itself, Patsy? Yeah, it's a good question. And um, so when it comes to insecticide toxicity, if that's affected the river, it's really variable depend how how quickly it recovers. So say if the toxicity or the cyphermethrin um entered the river right at the top of the catchment, um it'll take a longer time, I imagine, to the for the river to recover. Because generally invertebrates like they will naturally drift downstream in the evening and that's how they, they colonize new areas. But say if the toxicity was right at the top of the catchment, uh, there are no invertebrates to recolonize. So it will take much longer. So it just depends where the pollution happened. If we're talking about toxicity, yeah, okay. so it just depends. Okay, yeah. great. And, and just um, maybe on the, on the, I just see another question on sheep dip there. Can you put used sheep dip into cattle uh, slurry tanks and mix it in with cattle slurry? You can yeah, there's not there's no there's no um there's nothing against that. I mean the microbes and and the cattle slurry will will work and act straight away on that 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 sheep picked up and, and break that down. Basically, that's what you want. Okay, and just another one there. Does farmyard manure in it to have to be covered if it's in the yard? Does it have to be covered? Well, look at if you have a, a meter a meter meter and a half of 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 rain falling over a winter uh, period. Um, ideally, you would want to have it covered because you're going to ha- create a lot of dirty water and potential effluent. Ideally, what you want is a an effluent tank to capture that um, that potential effluent. But look at if you can at all cover it um, because look at you you can have huge volumes of of of, of dirty water or effluent and and look at you're not going to be able to manage it and as a potential source again. And I and I think it's worth mentioning, Sean. There there are times grants available from the Department of Agriculture to cover those. And I, I just noticed one of your photos with, with cattle feeding in the yard. Like it's important that, you know, people, some people may not realize, but there are grants, 40% and 60% young farmer grants available. I know steel has gone up in price, but there are grants available there for farmers to actually to put those facilities in place and either contact your your, your consultant or your Chagas consultant and look at we, we, people would help you in, in, in that scenario. Um, maybe just Gary, if you want to comment on it, it's just something I'm thinking here in my head. Pa- breaking the pathway, um, you know, for farmers, what you know, do we, I know Patsy talked about it and, and Sean talked about it, but what can we do or what can farmers do to break that pathway for 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 those, you know, if if, if anyone that has, has 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 issues, maybe you know. Um, well, I suppose as, as Patsy touched on, um, it, it kind of depends what the pathway is. First, it's part of the you know the conceptual model that we would try and develop of a catchment. Um, looking if it's underground flow, if it's uh, overland flow, depending on what that is, James. To be honest, so but you know one of the one of the most common uh, 
sort of pathway breakers that we would use as interception, really, um, whether that be sediment traps, um, buffer zones, riparian strips and the likes. I mean, Sean would probably be a better place to, to kind of comment on where they're best recommended. We would kind of make the assessments of what the issues are and then just the way our program works, you know, we, we kind of refer them back through Sean and, and he does the he does the engagement work then, I suppose, with the farmers um, and they try and get that agreement, you know, on what's most feasible, um, what would be acceptable for the farmers to put in. Um, but that's that, uh, you know, as Patsy says, that's where we see the most opportunity, really. Um, there's no point fixing, you know, tr trying to take pollutants out of a river if they're just going to come in again behind it. Uh, sometimes the, the, the source, it's impossible to stop, you know. Um, so it's, it's that break in the pathway and trying to prevent it getting there, you know, that's, that's where we ha have that opportunity. Great, great. Um, that thanks, Gary. Um, just I suppose maybe to you, Sean or Patsy, if you want to comment on it. You know, I'm just thinking that there's probably a lot of old sheep dip facilities out there, um, around the round the the different parts of Sligo Leach and Donegal. Is there any help available, or is there anything available in terms of trying to maybe do a few of these up? Or Sean, do you know, or is there was there something been talked about today here? Well, I suppose look at the, look at the, there's a catchment care project over there, and and the fund, for example, um, and look at they're they're, they're doing a lot of good work, um, with, you know, with the farmers out in that area, um, you know, where historically there has been a sheep dip issue, uh, in a particular part of that that river, I suppose. But look at there will be more funding opportunities available, no doubt, because um, at the end of the day, uh, you know government is listening to, to, to the results of what's coming back in this program and uh, I, I suppose look at they'll have to put the instruments and, and, and the, the you know the legislation and, and the funding opportunities and make them make them available basically to the farmers in those areas so you know look at you know if watch the space you know we're in an interim now between 2023 but i can see uh you know you know the farmers will be incentivized um to some extent over over, over the next while okay okay I could just probably add on to that james just in terms of Sean just mentioned the you know the kind of legislative gaps that are there and that's something that the program has recognized you know and the, the kind of governance structures that are in place for water quality at the moment in the country that have come in since the the second cycle of river basin management plan so we would have, you know, a national technical implementation group um, and the topic of sheep dip has come up with that, you know, that one of the biggest issues we have with it is, is the inadequate facilities for disposal. I mean, nobody wants, nobody, nobody's wanting to tip it under the stream or under the river or it, it, it's just that the, the facilities aren't really there. So there is work being done, you know, kind of at the top tables. Um, that has been discussed at the at NTIG. Um, it'll move on up through the through the governance channels, you know, um, so that it should be addressed at some point, but as everyone knows, I'm sure those wheels kind of turn slowly. So yeah, well, I, I think, and I think we all we all know on, on, on this call, I suppose f farmers want to do the right thing, and I think we have to give them the we have to give them the tools to be able to do the the right thing, you know, and, and that's our role and your role, and we're, I suppose we all have to work work on this together, and and I suppose just. Just maybe that brings me on to a, 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 another point. I, I think everyone on this call, it's important that, that people on the call understand that, you know, we're, we're, it, this is a teamwork approach in terms of a positive approach. It's not a stick or it's not an inspection approach. It's, it's, it's Law Pro, it's Chagas ASAP, it's Sean and Patsy working with farmers. And, and, and what I would say is, you know, sometimes maybe farmers might see a, a problem themselves on their own farm. And I, I suppose, what you know, if, if a farmer has an issue, you know, I suppose, I assume there's no issue. He picks up the phone and he rings Sean Rorty and Patsy Ryan on the basis of, look, at I, I think I have an issue here. Maybe could someone come out and give me a bit of help? Would, would that be the on the right roads? Um, oh, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. No, no, that, that's, yeah. that's, that's purely my, my role. It's, 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 it's a best practice advice advisory role. Um, there's no le there's no legislation is there in terms of best practice, surely, but there's no there's no stick approach uh, attached to yeah. my job. And and I think it's just to make that point, as I said, you know that you know the help is there. And even if a farmer has an issue, and he might want a bit of a help or a chat, with, and even a five minute chat about something, I think it'd be good to to give us a call. Just one question came in there late now, and I'm just conscious of the time is ten past. Do you see more problems with nitrogen or phosphorus coming off fields into waterways in Donegal? Is the question here? Phosphorus would be the, the main one, you know. That's 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 our that's our baby here in Donegal. I'm, I'm sure. Just that, explain that when you say the nitrogen is more down south issue. I'm not saying it's total, uh, but maybe explain. Yeah. It. Well, you see, you, nitrogen is, is is lost 
basically by leaching uh, mainly, and that's lost down through the soil as such. Um, and look, we have free draining soils in the county, in the east of the county, and so on. And um, nitrate is a problem in those those type areas. But phosphorus happen phosphorus loss happens by runoff, so that's overland flow over the soil surface. And basically, when that when that happens, is you know it just directly into uh, streams and water courses. And look, it's all down basically to soil type, whether it's free draining. But nitrogen goes down, or if it's you know if it's a phosphorus problem, it just runs over the, the soil surface, and that's that's basically the the deciding factor. And as, as as James says, look, nitrogen problem is is, is really a, a problem that's confined to, the, to the, the better land in the south and the southeast of the the, the country. Um, once you go west of the Shannon, it, it's really uh, confined to a phosphorus problem, and that's just soil type basically. Okay, and, and look yeah, at the come back to the. Go back to the, the pathways, really, Sean. Um, yeah. You know what? Did you say that there was a good uh, EPA produced a report during the summer there? The that nitrogen risk assessment where they kind of highlighted the most at risk catchments, and it was quite. You know, there was sort of a graphic, a map presented at the end of it, um, and the red, as you say, Sean, was all down kind of the southeast, southwest direction. So. Yeah. 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 Great. Thanks, Gary. Just uh, maybe a final one, and, and it's just because it's the time of year and. And it, it's only a, an observation or a comment from me. So a lot of people, and I've seen you had slides up there, Sean, a lot of cattle going into yards now, right? Um, going into sheds, uh, people feeding from silage pits. You know, I, I always remember my own time in advisory, these silage chambers, you know, turning, you were catching the effluent. And then what advice are you giving? Like if you could give advice quickly to people with cattle in sheds and silage pits now and i know downpipes i always remember reps was a great scheme every farmer used to keep his downpipes fairly right and and it's something maybe we're, we're missing a bit but or patsy do you want to comment on what little bit of advice could we give to farmers now this time of year you know in terms of trying to keep those areas clean and and, and pollutant free Oh, I think Sean would be the best place for this. Yeah, yeah you're right. You're <laughs> I right. stick to the river. <laughs> yeah. Um, look at look at uh, still when I go out, I'm still seeing you know, especially about a month, month and a half ago, um, leaves were cluttering up a lot of the the downpipes, etc., on, on yards. And I suppose at that stage, pits were only starting to be opened up a wee bit, and. Um, you know, there wasn't really a problem uh, in the yard as such. But you know, as time goes on and uh, as we move into the winter, and and these areas, be, you know, get more soiled up, etc. In the yards, as as trying to minimise that that clean water ending up with, with with your dirty water. Um, make sure that everything's working above the yard in terms of your eave shoots and your gutter, etc. Uh, that your that your clean water is diverted away and uh, into your uh, clean water outlet. And that then again, that you're, you know, that you're, you're brushing, brushing the yard, scraping it, whatever you're doing, and you're capturing that, and, and that's going back into your, your tank, basically. Great, great. Now, enough questions asked the old folks. Look at um, huge thanks um, to um, Patsy, the, Patsy Ryan, to Gary O'Connell, and to Sean Rorty for uh, a very informative evening, folks. Um, I think. I think the, the, the key message is, is, is that we're all in this together. And, and I know for a fact from talking to farmers and yourselves, you know, everyone wants the, the best going forward. And it's, it's just to try and find, as I said, you know, those solutions. And maybe we, we are the conduit to try and help these people put a few solutions in place. So huge thanks uh, tonight. Um, next week, folks, uh, next Tuesday night, we're, we're, we're talking, the topic is uh, sheep uh, again. We're going to talk with uh, Shane McHugh and Eamon Wa Shane McHugh from Chagas and Eamon Wall from Sheep Ireland talk about sheep flock recording. So it's something very interesting for, for everyone. So we leave it at that. And a huge thanks again to, to Sean, Patsy and Gary. So good night, everybody. Good night. Okay, good night. Thanks. Good luck.